Hello and welcome to the algebras. In this lecture, lecture number eight, we will talk about semi-simple Lie algebras. Let's start with the definition of a simple Lie algebra. A Lie algebra G is called simple, provided that it has dimension greater than one and the only ideals of G as a zero ideal and G itself. The condition that the dimension of G is greater than one can be replaced by the condition that G is not abelian. In other words, that the derived algebra of G is non-zero. For example, the Lie algebra SL2 is simple if and only if the characteristic of the base field is different from 2. Indeed, if the characteristic of the base field is equal to 2, then we have seen in the previous lectures that the derived algebra of SL2 equals the linear span of the diagonal element H. And this is a proper ideal of SL2. So in this case, SL2 cannot be simple. If the characteristic of K is different from 2, let us assume that SL2 has a non-zero ideal I. Note that all vectors from the standard basis, the elements F, H, and E, are eigenvectors for the adjoint operator of H with different eigenvalues. F has eigenvalue minus 2, H has eigenvalue 0, and E has eigenvalue 2. Therefore, applying the adjoint operator of H, we conclude that I should have at least one of these eigenvectors. But then, having one of these eigenvectors, we can use the adjoint operators for E and F to get all the others. This follows directly from the computation of the Lie bracket and the Lie algebra SL2. Therefore, our ideal I contains all basis vectors and hence coincides with SL2. This shows that SL2, in the case of the base field having characteristic different from 2, is a simple Lie algebra. Observe that if G is simple, then the derived algebra of G coincides with G. Note that the derived algebra of G is an ideal. If it is zero, then the algebra G is abelian, and then any subspace is an ideal. So in order to have no non-zero ideals, the dimensions should be one, and this is prohibited. So the derived algebra of G must be non-zero. But if it is non-zero and an ideal, then by simplicity it should coincide with G. Another observation is that if G is a simple Lie algebra, then the adjoint G module is simple. This is because any submodule of an adjoint G module is an ideal of G. This means that G has only two ideals, 0 and G. Now we are ready to define semi-simple Lie algebras. A Lie algebra G is called semi-simple, provided that it is isomorphic to a direct sum of simple Lie algebras. For example, any simple Lie algebra is semi-simple. Observation. If G is a semi-simple Lie algebra, then the derived algebra of G is equal to G. To prove this, let us write our G as a direct sum of simple Lie algebras. Then we can compute the derived algebra of G. Using the bilinearity of the Lie bracket, the derived algebra of G is equal to the direct sum over I and J of the commutators of G i and G j. But since G is a direct sum of Lie algebras, the commutator of G i and G j for different i and j is zero. Therefore, this sum equals the sum over i, the commutator of G i and G i. Since each G i is simple, the derived algebra of G i is G i. So this direct sum of commutators coincides with the direct sum of the G i's, which is equal to G by definition. This completes the proof of our observation. From this it follows that the Lie algebra G L and K is never semi-simple because its derived algebra is equal to SLN and this is always different from GLN. SLN consists of matrices of trace zero in GLN. Another example is that solvable algebras are not semi-simple as the derived algebra of a non-zero solvable Lie algebra always differs from the algebra itself. Let us now talk about the radical of a Lie algebra. We start with the following lemma. Let i and j be solvable ideals of a Lie algebra G. Then their sum is also a solvable ideal. Clearly, the sum of two ideals is an ideal. So let us prove that it is solvable. Consider the flag 0 is a subset of i and this is a subset of i plus j. In this flag i is a solvable ideal by assumption. 
and the subquotient i plus j modulo i by one of the isomorphism theorems is isomorphic to j modulo i intersection with j. Since j is solvable, any quotient of it is solvable. Therefore, this subquotient is also solvable, which means that i plus j is an extension of two solvable Lie algebras and hence is solvable. As a consequence of this lemma, every finite dimensional Lie algebra G contains a unique solvable ideal that contains all other solvable ideals of G. So it contains a solvable ideal, which is the maximum element in the partially ordered set of all solvable ideals of G with respect to inclusions. This unique biggest solvable ideal of G is called the radical of G and is denoted by rad of G. Claim the radical of every finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra is zero. Proof the fact that our Lie algebra G is semi-simple implies that the adjoint representation is semi-simple. So we can write the adjoint representation as a direct sum of the radical. The radical is an ideal, so it's a submodule of the adjoint representation. Since the adjoint representation is semi-simple, we can find the complement of this submodule. So we can write G as a direct sum of A and the radical of G in the adjoint module. Then in particular, the commutator of A and the radical of G is zero because this direct sum decomposition in the adjoint module means that both A and radical of G are ideals of G and they have zero intersection, so the commutator is zero. Therefore, the equality that G is equal to the derived algebra, which we know holds for any semi-simple Lie algebra, can be now computed using this decomposition and the fact that components of the decomposition are orthogonal. So the derived algebra of G is equal to the direct sum of the derived algebra of A and the derived algebra of the radical. The derived algebra of A is a subalgebra of A. The derived algebra of the radical is a subalgebra of the radical. So altogether, this is a subspace of G. So the equality that G is equal to G forces that the derived algebra of the radical must be equal to the radical itself. But since the radical is solvable, this implies that the radical equals zero. This proves our claim. So let us now give a characterization of semi-simple Lie algebras over algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. Assume that K is an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. Let G be a finite dimensional Lie algebra over K. We claim that the following conditions are equivalent. The first condition, the algebra G is semi-simple. The second condition, the algebra G does not have any non-zero abelian ideals. The third condition, the algebra G doesn't have any non-zero solvable ideals. The fourth condition, the killing form of G is non-degenerate. Again, this fourth condition is usually called the Cartan criterion for semi-simplicity. And the fifth condition, the radical of G is zero. Note that we have already proved that one implies five on the previous slide. The equivalence of three and five is obvious by the definition. And the fact that three implies two is also obvious because any abelian ideal is a solvable. So let us now prove the implication that 2 implies 3. In other words, that the fact that G doesn't have any non-zero abelian ideals implies that it doesn't have any non-zero solvable ideals. To start with, let's note that if we have two ideals of G, then their commutator is again an ideal. So the proof uses the Jacobi identity. For any element A in G, any element X in the first ideal, and any element Y in the second ideal, we compute the bracket of A with a bracket of X and Y. So using the Jacobi identity, we can write it as a sum of two summons. The first one is a bracket of A and X bracketed with Y. Since I is an ideal, this first sign bracket belongs to i, so the outer bracket is an element of the commutator of i and j. Similarly for the second summand, since y belongs to j and j is an ideal of g, the bracket of a and y belongs to j, and so the outer bracket of x with this bracket of a and y belongs to the commutator of i and j. Altogether, the whole thing belongs to the commutator of i and j, which shows that this commutator is an ideal of g. The consequence of this 
is that for any ideal i of g, the case derived algebra of i is also an ideal of g, because this is just taking the commutator, then taking the commutator of the commutator, and so on, k times. So all derived algebras of any ideal of g are also ideals of G. In particular, if we have a non-zero solvable ideal of G, then there is a non-negative integer k such that the case derived algebra of I is non-zero. And this case derived algebra of I is then an abelian ideal of G. This proves the implication that 2 implies 3 in our zero. Next we prove the implications that 4 implies 2. In other words, that the fact that the killing form is non-degenerate implies that we do not have any abelian ideals. How we prove that? We prove that by establishing that any non-zero abelian ideal of G belongs to the kernel of the killing form. To see this, we choose a basis in G which starts from some basis of I and then completes it to a basis of G. In such a basis, the adjoint operator for any element x in our abelian ideal I has the following matrix. So here the zero in the top left corner corresponds to the bracket of x with elements in i. Since i is an abelian ideal, this is zero. And since i is an ideal, this means that all other elements in g, when bracketed with x, end up with i, which means that the only non-zero part of our matrix is in the top right corner, and that all other things are zero. And similarly, if we have an arbitrary element y from our Lie algebra, the metric of the adjoint operator for y in the same basis has the following form. This is because if we bracket y with an element of i, we get an element of i because i is an ideal. Therefore, bottom left corner will be zero. From these forms of the matrices, it follows that their product has the following form. In particular, the diagonal blocks are zero, and the trace of this matrix is zero. This, by definition, implies that the ideal i belongs to the kernel of the killing form. So if the algebra G has an abelian ideal, then the killing form has a non-trivial kernel and hence cannot be non-degenerate. This proves the implication that non-degeneracy of K implies that the algebra G doesn't have any abelian ideals. Let us now prove the implication that the absence of solvable ideals in G implies non-degeneracy of the killing form. The necessary claim follows from the following Lemma. The kernel of the killing form is a solvable ideal of G. From the previous lecture, we already know that the kernel of the killing form is an ideal of G. This follows from the associativity of the killing form. Let us choose a basis in G, which starts with some basis in the kernel K of the killing form and then completes it to a basis of G. In this basis, for every element X in the kernel K, the matrix of the adjoint operator for X in the adjoint representation of G in this basis looks as follows. So since X is in the ideal, when bracketing X with an element in the ideal K, we stay in the ideal. Therefore, in the top left corner, we will have the matrix of the adjoint operator of X in the adjoint representation of K. Since I is an ideal, elements from the Lie algebra when bracketed with X end up in k. So in the top right corner we will have something, but then in the second row we will have zeros because bracketing with elements in the ideal ends up in the ideal. Note that the product of matrices of this form again has this form, and the trace of such a matrix coincides with the trace of its diagonal block in the top left corner. This implies that the killing form for the ideal k coincides with the restriction of the killing form of the whole algebra G to the ideal k. Since k was the kernel of the killing form for the algebra G, it follows that the killing form of the ideal k equals zero. But then we can use the Cartan criterion for solvability of Lie algebras and deduce that k is a solvable Lie algebra. Recall that Cartan criterion says that Lie algebra is solvable if and only if the derived algebra of this Lie algebra is orthogonal to the whole Lie algebra with respect to the killing form. In particular, if the killing form is identically zero, this is clearly satisfied, and therefore any Lie algebra with identically zero killing form is solvable. The kernel of the killing form is a solvable ideal of G, which implies 
that if G has no solvable ideals, then the kernel of the killing form is zero, which means that the killing form is non-degenerate. This proves the implication 3 implies 4 in our characterization. Finally, let us prove the implication that in the case when the killing form of the Lie algebra is non-degenerate, the Lie algebra is semi-simple. To prove this implication, let I be a non-zero minimal ideal of G. Then the orthogonal subspace of I is also an ideal of G. This we saw in the previous lecture. Since the killing form is now assumed to be non-degenerate, the intersection of I with its orthogonal subspace is zero, because any element in the intersection belongs to the kernel of the killing form. In particular, it follows that the whole algebra G is a direct sum of two ideals, i and its orthogonal subspace, and, subsequently, that the commutator of i with the orthogonal subspace of i is zero, because this commutator belongs to the intersection, which is zero. Also note that the Lie algebra i does not have any proper non-zero ideals because of the minimality of i. We have assumed that i is a minimal ideal, so there are no ideals between 0 and i. So this means that our i has no proper non-zero ideals. Furthermore, the Lie algebra i is not abelian because the restriction of the killing form to i coincides by the argument from the previous slide to the restriction of the killing form at g to i, and this must be non-zero because the killing form is non-degenerate. Putting these two properties together, we conclude that I is a simple Lie algebra. The orthogonal complement I perpendicular of I is an ideal, and the restriction of the killing form for G to this orthogonal complement coincides, by the arguments from the previous slide, to the killing form on the orthogonal complement. And again, since G is a direct sum of I and I orthogonal, this restriction must be non-degenerate because the killing form of G is non-degenerate. Consequence, we can now use induction on the dimension of G. So we have I is a simple direct sum of G, and the orthogonal complement of I has strictly smaller dimensions than the dimension of G, and the killing form of this Lie algebra is non-degenerate. So by induction, we can deduce that the orthogonal complement of I is a semi-simple Lie algebra, and hence the algebra G is semi-simple. This proves the application 4 implies 1 in our characterization and completes the proof of the characterization. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.